Gene Sperling was the director of the National Economic Council for both Presidents Obama and Clinton. He's here with my colleague, James Fallows. Uh, Jim Fallows, Gene Sperling, welcome. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Margaret. Thanks, Gene, for coming. Thank you all for being here. We're going to mainly talk economics, of course, but I can't resist seizing on the news <laughs> the last 10 minutes. Uh, who was listening to the Donald Trump rational foreign policy speech so advertised in the last, last half hour? Um, I'm going to ask you, Donald Trump, in a written red speech, said that the name for his policy was America first. This wasn't something he was, was winging. Stipulating you don't have any official role with any political campaign right now, but you're a long, long time Democrat. How should the country think about America first being the label, you know, that dating back to the isolationists before World War II? How would you attack that? How should we think about Donald Trump's role in our public deliberations right now? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing because there's no secret I go back to with the Clintons uh, 24 years now, and I'm a uh, outside advisor to her campaign now. So, um, you know, all disclosure out there. Uh, but a lot of people come and tell me, well, you should, you should root for him because he'll be an easier general election candidate. And I cannot uh, root for him no matter what. Uh, <laughs> so I've been really happy to learn that uh, before I was a Hillary Clinton supporter or a Democrat, uh, uh, I, I was a human being, <laughs> and still am. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. Everybody has Twitter, right? Uh, Gene Sperling, human being. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I, I worry about what he does to our national discourse. Um, even in my, my own life, I have had to deal with very young people who we know, who are of Mexican descent, in tears, uh, scared. Um, I have already seen and heard the discussion about whether in schools now it is okay to uh, mock people because of their personal characteristics. I mean, how do you tell a 10-year-old or 14-year-old you can't do that when uh, a nominee for the President of the United States does that on a regular basis on national TV. Uh, this is a person who, when attacked by the New York Times, made hand motions mocking of a brave, great journalist who happened to have a disability. In what other element of our life would we find that behavior acceptable? And what worries me now or I think a challenge for a lot of people is somebody who talks about rounding up 11 million people, somebody who says, talks about Mexicans as rapists and other things and just adds at the end, well, but there's some good ones. Uh, somebody who speaks with vile about a religion, uh, about Muslims, about people, our neighbors, our friends, people we know here, in almost every context, that would not be allowed. And so for a lot of people, people are going to have to do a gut check on their values. Do, are things that are clearly anti-Hispanic, anti-Muslim, uh, uh, anti the type of civility you expect in our country, are they suddenly going to be OK if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee? Is it something that we have to accept? And I would say the answer has to be no. You don't put your values on hold. You don't put them on check just because somebody is accepted by a ma majority, if it happens, of the uh, Republican primary. And, you know, as far as I knew, it wasn't Democrat or Republican, whether you were uh, you didn't mock religion or an ethnicity. I would say I've been here for 24 years. I have been involved in tough campaigns with people like Mitt Romney and John McCain and Bob Dole and both President Bushes. And we've won some and we've lost some. But I never, ever 
would have thought that they were the type, I never thought for a second that there was a risk that if they won, there was a risk the policies I believe in wouldn't happen. But I never worried for our kind of national discourse, our national values like I do now. So we could spend the rest of this day yes. and many days on this theme. Let me just ask you one follow-up about it. It does seem very, very likely now, as of last night, that the race is going to be Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump as the nominees of the major parties. As somebody who is friendly to, though not officially part of the, the Clinton team, would you suggest she make this, she have some, uh, this be the major theme of her campaign, the need for tolerance and American inclusiveness, or how, how frontal do candidates become in, in opposing what you're talking about? Well, you know, I'm, I'm one of many people who offer her advice, and that list will get bigger and bigger. Uh, but, um, but I think if you've already heard what, if you already hear what she says now, I think she, she's already, sound, she's been sounding this theme for a while that in the middle of all this, she's been talking about the importance of bringing people together. She's been talking about kindness, uh, about what kind of society we want to be. So I think she's already been doing that. And I would expect that, that she would continue to do it. Because again, she's been somebody who's, you know, has very strong, passionate, progressive values, but also understands that we're a country that's very diverse in so many ways. And we gotta figure out a way to grow together as a country, not grow apart. Let's talk economics now. There are two contending, almost separate world narr economic narratives uh, in this presidential election. The one from the Obama administration is that there's been slow, steady progress in job creation, in, in every other way that you could measure things economically. The Republican narrative is that essentially things have never been, things are bad and getting worse and about to go off a cliff. Of course we know that the point of, of presidential elections is the out party always says that things, things are bad. What is your, pers how do you see, how do you put the improvements that have happened since the crash of 08, how do you put them in the same perspective as all the things that are still wrong and, right. and uh, failed about the economy? Well, um, now I'm gonna, my, my previous comment probably put me at odds with any Trump supporters here. Now I'm going to put myself at odds with anybody who's from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm a very big Michigan football fan. <laughs> and we have a new coach named Jim Harbaugh. And before he came, we were five and seven, didn't even make a bowl game. The very next year, we were, I believe, 11 and 2, 11 and 3. Uh, we're in the top 12 in the country, won our bowl game. There is no Michigan football fan, really, on the planet that has any trouble recognizing at the same time that under Jim Harbaugh, Michigan football has got dramatically better, but still not good enough because we lost Ohio State for the 10th out of 11 years. <laughs> Now, I don't know why it is, but for your average football fan, they have no problem in recognizing things have gotten dramatically better, that coach has done a good job, but things aren't perfect yet. Somehow in the economy, people have a harder time. They want like either all's great or all's terrible. So what's the reality? The reality is that Barack, when we came into office, it was one of the most scary times in our country. I mean, I, I can't tell you the clenched stomachs you had when you went in. It, it's, it, you know, if you tell, remind people what the numbers were back then, it looks like you're being, you know, must be being political, but just, just grasp this for a second. Right now in our economy, when the jobs number comes out, if it comes out at plus 220, 220,000 jobs up, everybody says, that is terrific, numbers go up stock market goes up. If it was at 160,000, people would say, ah, disappointing number. So the difference between being up 220,000 or up 160,000 is considered significant. We were losing 
losing 800,000 private sector jobs a month when we came in office. I so remember being in the Roosevelt Room in a meeting with the president and looking, you know, sneaking a peek at my phone and seeing that the Dow was under 7,000. There was a 20 to 30 percent chance it would go to 5,000. That's not a Wall Street issue. That is a pension savings issue. So there was a real chance that we could go into a depression. We were doing absolutely brand new things uh, that nobody had tried before. Um, and I give credit for, let me make strike a bipartisan note. I, I think that everything that had to do with the financial crisis was terribly unpopular. And that's why you got to give, I think, President Bush a little credit for letting Hank Paulson do things that were very, very unpopular, like start the process on the auto uh, rescue. Uh, for President Obama, uh, things to stabilize the financial crisis were hard, politically unpopular, uh, and, and probably hurt him more politically than anything. But these, this was doing the right thing, and as a result, we did not go into uh, tailspin. By the way, the $800 billion stimulus was actually signed into law on February 17th. Now think about that. He came into office on January 20th. There was no demand anywhere in the world. And within a month, with everybody from both sides screaming and unhappy, you launched a financial rescue program, you launched an $800 billion recovery act, and America never did go into a tailspin. And in fact was in recovery before the end of 2009. And no other of our peers have recovered as fast. Uh, uh, so now, here's a question for you. When Mitt Romney was running for president in 2012, what was his big economic promise? He said that by the end of his term, if he was elected president, he would bring unemployment to 6%. That really shook up that table there. They, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, no way. He said 6% and it's 5% and actually he's been 4.9 under Obama. Why are people not, you know, building, you know, some statutes for him? Um, no, but the point is, is that had anybody at that time said, uh, you know, had anybody at that time said in early 2009, hey, you know, six, seven years out, uh, all would have turned out that all the, the, the TARP assistance to banks, et cetera, was paid back actually with a profit, uh, that unemployment was 5% had dipped into the fours, that the deficit had gone to 10% to down to below 3%, I think people would have thought that was you know, quite a strong performance, especially because, and this is important, most people accepted the Ken Rogoff, Carmen Reinhardt view, which is that when you have a, a devastating financial crisis, it's really terrible for two reasons. One, the crisis itself. But second, it's harder to have a strong recovery. Why? Because when you have kind of a pent-up demand recovery, as soon as people feel good, like in 1983 and 84, they go out and start buying cars and houses, and you get the pent-up demand and the great recovery. When you have a financial crisis recovery, people deleverage, meaning they pay down their debt, they pay down their credit cards. So as things get healthier, it's harder to pull out. So when you look at all of those things, you have to be you know, pretty impressed with the degree we did not go into a deeper tailspin and that we've recovered. Now, two, two caveats to that. One is, I think in the United States as with around the world, we have not done as well as we should have on fiscal policy. We have in our country hundreds of billions of dollars of deferred maintenance. I don't mean like new beautiful toys or great new things you want to build or buy. I mean bridges that are going to fall down, broken windows, asbestos in schools. You have to fix them at some point, right? Like you don't get fiscal discipline credit 
for not fixing them. If I tell you that I canceled my DirecTV, you know, su subscription to or to watch the Detroit Lions on Sundays, you'd say, oh, well, you good dad, you saved some consumption for your kid. If I said, oh, there's a leaking pipe in the basement and I'm just not going to do with it, you don't go fiscally responsible dad. You go, you're going to pay a lot more later. So what reason would there possibly have been to not fix everything in 2010, 2011, and 2012? You would never have had interest rates so low. You need, the, the labor market was so deeply scarred. You had so many construction workers and people in housing, et cetera, that were out of jobs uh, who would have been very happy to take work almost, you know, probably any hours to be back at work supporting their families. And when the president proposed many of these things in the American Jobs Act, it was shut down. So when people judge President Obama, you have to remember that he did not get to implement his full fiscal policy, which would have had a lot more demand. And as a result, what you're seeing around the world is, in the United States and other places, monetary policies who've gone from being the lender of last resort to kind of the economic savior of last resort. And at every point, they say it would have been better with stronger fiscal policy. And which was my, my last point, which I think is extremely important, which is the wage issue and the income issue is much longer trend. When I left the, if you look at my last year as National Economic Advisor for Bill Clinton 2000, till today, the typical family, in real terms, is making $4,000 less. They've gone up a little the last couple of years, so things are getting better. But over 15 years, the typical family is struggling. We also have an issue that when you have the kind of scarring that you get from the Great Recession, you have more people who are long-term unemployed, more people who may be now stigmatized from being out of the labor force. We already have people who have struggled to get back in the labor force, like people leaving, uh, coming out from prison where there's more focus on. There's no program that is as good as a tight labor market. So the reason why I believe that we should have had more fiscal impetus, more demand, the reason I opposed the Fed even raising rates when they did is because I still believe right now that a tighter labor market, both because of what it would do for raising wages and incomes for families and because it would give more incentive to give people who've been out of the labor force and want to get back in a chance in is one of the, the most important things we could do now. So a specific and a general follow-up from that. The specific one is about whether a substantially higher minimum wage, let's say $15 nationwide, would that be a practical way to remedy some of these problems? More generally, if this is a second Gilded Age, economically and yet politically it's a time of paralysis, what can any next president actually do to offset some of these economic trends? Well, I believe that the challenge of our time, the economic challenge of our time is, is the change in technology, finance, and globalization strengthening or hollowing out middle classes? I mean, that is the, the economic challenge of our time. And I believe it's not just in the United States. I believe virtually every country is wrestling with that. In the last six, seven years of the 90s, it looked like the answer to that question might be on the positive side. Uh, our small businesses seem to adopt the internet quicker. Uh, our productivity was higher. You actually had six or seven years where wages went up for all five groups, they went up faster for African Americans, et cetera. Um, and you know, I can't blame this all just on the next administration. Uh, I, don't th I don't think they did the right things, but I think there were very, a lot of bigger things happening. And now you have seen a return to stagnant or even falling wages. And I think that has to be the great challenge of our time. Now, I think some of that has to be you know, I don't think there's a silver bullet there. I and mean, people want silver bullets, but there's not probably a silver bullet. I think one, 
you push for more tighter labor markets, which is first point. That will help with wages. That will help getting more people in. That will help with rising incomes. Uh, number two, I think you have to have an agenda that looks at how you can attract and maintain value-added jobs in the United States. And I think that means having a smart manufacturing innovation agenda. I think we should be creating jobs by renovating and bringing energy efficiency everywhere we can. I think we need a dramatic uh, new progress in how we help people match skills and credentials to jobs needed. So I think there's a lot that we have to do. But I also think there's a role for public policy. And raising the minimum wage is one of the most direct ways to ensure that people who work full time live in dignity. Bill Clinton's great line from the 92 campaign, if you work full time, you should not have to raise your children in poverty. A lot of Americans believe that. The increase in the earned income tax credit through the Clinton and Obama administrations, and even a little in the Bush administration, has really helped. It's probably helped, refundable tax credits have probably helped lift 10 million people out of poverty. But I do think you, that trying to increase the minimum wage as much as makes economic sense is the right thing. And I think, I think that what you saw Governor Brown and Governor Cuomo do is, is I think the smart approach. I actually think this is an area where there just really isn't as much disagreement like between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton when you get outside of the political context. Why? Because I think she and a lot of us would like to see $15 where it makes sense. Now, if you're in a community where the median wage is $15, it just, you can't make the minimum wage the median wage. You can't. Uh, smart progressive economists often Larry Michelle at EPI, others talk about trying to get the minimum wage to 60%. So I think the idea of aspiring to $15 everywhere you can, as soon as you can, is a very admirable goal. And the movements that have led to that are just inspiring. I mean, you, people taking action, improving their economic lot, improving dignity work is, is I think, inspiring. I think at the same time, allowing governors to have some adjustment for parts of their, you know, for either smaller businesses, as, as Jerry Brown did, or as Andrew Cuomo did, looking where, you know, a state like New York is like a country. There are some places it makes sense and not. So I think we should be pushing the envelope. Uh, and I think the fight for 15 has been a very powerful thing. And I think the key is now to do it in a way that's sensible, that raises wages as much as possible, but doesn't end up hurting some rural community somewhere where it's just too high related to the median wage. So just one more question for me before we have time for one or two from the floor. Another great central theme in the political economics of this cycle has been the crookedness of the financial system. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's rigged against people, et cetera. Not going back to whether people should have been punished in different ways um, eight, eight years ago, how should we think about the Dodd-Frank bill and its consequences and what more needs to be done? Well, you know, I, I think Dodd-Frank was a very significant uh, piece of legislation and achievement, and it's made progress. Uh, like any major piece of legislation, I'm sure we're going to find areas where it didn't go far enough. I think there's probably some places where there maybe has been unintentional negative effects, perhaps on community banks. Um, I've, you know, I've come to believe that even though there's provisions that didn't impact community banks, that too many community banks have had to go through onerous accounting, legal things to prove they don't, they were never intended. I think there's probably some relief for community banks out there. On the other hand, um, there's two provisions in there that would really allow uh, regulators to take pretty significant actions, force restructuring or even breaking up. There's section 121, which calls, allows them to do that where there's grave harm. And then there's 165D, which is the living will section. Um, and I think one of the questions is, and I think you know, the position Secretary Clinton has taken is that those are strong and we should try to deploy them. But she's also suggested that she would support strengthening those as well. Um, uh, and I think, you know, Partly, we're, we're watching things. We just saw the Living Wills report come back in a disappointing way. 
Um, we've seen a, a court rule that uh, against the FSOC on including MetLife. Uh, you know, these could be arguments for why you do need to to strengthen or give you know regulators more tools to enforce that people are complying. For me personally, uh, and this all isn't always the most popular thing to say when you're consulting on the economic side, but I, I think the achievement of the CFPB is extremely important. Um, and you know, I don't agree with Elizabeth Warren on everything, but what she did, Michael Barr, Barney Frank, President Obama, what they did in helping to create this is extremely important because for typical people who are living their lives, the, the ability to be taken advantage of, the confusion on financial issues, the harm that was done to people during the financial crisis, it's not just about blatant fraud, it's about a breakdown of responsibility, of underwriting. So the idea that there's now going to be a no before you owe, I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated group. How, how do you do when you look at a mortgage application? You got it? You understand it all? I mean, this is a helpful, positive thing. And so, you know, I don't think that means that those of us who were part of creating it should just be, you know, just be defense. We should be willing to acknowledge where it may have had negative unintended consequences, and we should be willing to acknowledge where it may need to be strengthened. Uh, and it probably does need some of both. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think overall, we as a country had to respond. We cannot sit back and let the same thing happen again. Because this, a recession is painful, but this type of deep, harmful financial crisis with the difficulty it meant for recovery has wounded people's lives and dreams and retirement plans for tens of millions of people. And you have to, if you don't have a strong never again strategy, if you lose that two or three years after when things are a little better, you can't remember, then, you know, shame on us. Yeah. Probably have time for a question. Who has, uh, yes, sir, here. You, you're first in my line of sight, so yes. The unfairness of head table. Alejandro Becerra, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, earlier, Alice Driblin, uh, Jason Furman, and Mark Sandney all uh, pointed to immigration reform has been an, an important priority. Mark also mentioned home ownership as yep. an important area to address. Uh, for the next several months and then afterwards, what can be done since the economic recession started with housing? What can be done to get a full recovery in the housing sector? Okay, so I'm going to make an immigration point very quickly and then, and then go to, to the housing, which I, is a great question and right question. First of all, immigration reform is the right thing to do. 11 million people now, particularly with the Trump presidency, worried about whether their families will be torn apart is perhaps the humanitarian. Trump, you, the Trump candidacy, I think you meant the to Trump say. Trump candidacy. <laughs> well, but, but, but people, but the fear, the yeah. fear that exists among children, family members, they'll be torn apart is a terrible thing. So from a humanitarian point of view, we should fix it. But economically, this is, this will mean higher revenues, it will mean more social security solvency, it will mean greater deficits being reduced. And the reason why, economically, beyond the fact that it will also bring in high-skilled visas that will help some companies, but the reason economically why you should want a path to citizenship is that clarifying that you are a citizen is going to give people more confidence to move to jobs, to buy homes, to do legal transactions. When people feel they can come out of the shadows, they are gonna purchase more. <laughs> They're gonna buy homes more. They're gonna pay their taxes more. So this is the right thing to, it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. On home ownership, you know, what they say about financial crisis is they happen when there's a complete breakdown of any kind of uh, uh, risk. Uh, uh, you know, c concern for risk. And we saw this, and you can watch it in the movie The Big Short, but we lived it. A complete breakdown of the rating agencies of any kind of underwriting measure. 
I still think that we are probably in a measure where then, then what happens is you overreact. And I think there is an overreaction going on. If you look at people, even with FICO scores between 660 and 720, they're getting 30, 40 percent less mortgages than they did, not, before, not during the buildup, I mean before the crisis ever happened. The Urban Institute uh, Housing Finance has looked and said, if you just had the same FICO scores you did pre-2005, how many more homes would there be? 2,000, uh, um, 5 million perhaps. This could be adding another half point to our economy. But very important is that um, one of the issues that we do not talk about enough is wealth inequality. We have huge wealth inequality, and our public policy makes it worse. We have an upside-down tax system for retirement savings, which gives, this is a pretty shocking statistic, the top 2% get more tax incentives for retirement savings, the top 2%, than the bottom 80% combined. That's because we have an upside-down tax system. But one of the things has been home ownership. To, while, the, while the inequality, particularly for Latino and African American families, wealth inequality has been terrible, one of the, the best opportunities has been home ownership. And this unfair tightening of credit uh, has shut out a lot of African American and Latino families. And I think it's, and, and it makes it, it will make wealth inequality worse not better, it takes away the American dream for more people. And some people think, oh, well, that was the problem, that somehow we were trying to increase home ownership too much for these groups. That is not the truth. That is not the evidence. The FHA didn't, had maybe 6% of the market. It was not low-income housing groups. They're the most anti-predatory lending policies. That was not. It was the policies whether you call them greed or herd mentality, but the breakdown. And the worst thing we should do is now punish uh, hardworking families who are credit worthy, who are often Latino or African American from their home ownership aspirations. Great. Thank you very much. There's many more questions we could ask, and I promise you Gene could answer all of them, but please let's <laughs> thank him for what he's done right now. Thank you. Thank you.